everyone, this is Max from the District 9400 Public Image Committee. A while ago, I had the absolute privilege of getting to speak to Stella, our district governor, and this is how that conversation went. Okay, I'm just gonna... Okay. All right, cool, so let's go. Um, first of all, I just wanna say I'm so excited to get the chance to speak to you formally. I mean, we met briefly at the... Yes. As you said, you've been so busy and you were running around and everyone wanted photos <laughs> so i'm happy to have my private time with stella <laughs> thank you thank you and where is this interview going to i mean who, what's the audience for this interview i'm not actually sure we had just discussed in the public image meeting that shireen wanted us yes. to one with you and then there's one with anna marie as well so maybe they'll probably put it up on the website or just so uh, okay i see yeah. okay all right that well, makes sense yeah, so um, I think getting right into it, we heard a lot about your career at the induction, you know, everything you've done in the field of medicine, and it's very impressive. But I think I want to know about your rotary career, because there's always a, a wild story to how people find themselves as part of this rotary family. So how did your career and journey in rotary start? You know that I wouldn't call it a career. With Rotary, it, it's voluntary. So a career I would, I, I would define as, you know, the work you choose to do. But, but Rotary is, is, uh, is, is not work. So I, I would say my journey probably in Rotary, not my career, because <laughs> it's not a career path. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, interesting. You would find out. Uh, to, I well, you would like to note that I joined Rotary from your country. You're from Zambia, right? Yes. I was working as an international, uh, uh, what they used to call expats in those days, uh, with a USAID funded project, and uh, my the university I had uh, um, been to in the US, where I did my Master of Public Health and my PhD they needed a, an epidemiologist for a USAID funded HIV and AIDS project that was in Zambia. And they contacted me and I agreed to go to Zambia for three years. Wow. That was from 94, all, well, from the end of 93, actually 94, 95 and 96. And it was while I was in Zambia uh, that a friend of mine who was in the UN, I hadn't joined the UN then, I didn't even know I was going to join the UN, but a friend of mine who was the World Health Organization representative in Zambia was a Rotarian. And I found out that a couple of members of my church were Rotarians and they kept on asking me, Stella, why don't you join Rotary? And I said, you know, I have not, it's so busy. I'm all over the place, Copper Belt, wherever, you know, Teach, I mean, HIV and AIDS was a big deal then in the early 90s. Mm. And this was an $8 million project that we were handling. Wow. It was busy. Yeah. But I decided to join Rotary because of the people that were in Rotary. It's the, I mean, I, it, 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 it was just seeing what they were doing. And I said, you know, I'd, I'd like to be among this group of people. In those days, National Immunization Days for polio was very, very important. And you could see Rotarians in different countries putting two drops of vaccine in children's mouths. You didn't need to be in the health field yeah. as a Rotarian to vaccinate. And that is what took me. I said, if people who were not trained to do this were giving part of their lives to serve, that's what you want to do. And that's why I became a Rotarian. But interestingly, uh, there were six clubs in Lusaka then. Uh, the club of my friend who invited me wanted me to join his club, and it was an all male club. There were no women in that club. Oh my gosh. And what interested me was the comments they made. They told me, and he, came, he, was, he was honest enough to tell me, he said, Stella, you know what? There were barons of industry in that, that club. There were the money bags of Lusaka. And they said, if a woman comes in here, we leave. Yes. That's why. Yes. And so I told my friend, no, don't disturb your club. I mean, I don't want you to lose your members. And I don't want you to lose your club. You stay in your club. There are five other clubs in Lusaka. Hmm. I will find a club that has women. And that's how I joined Rosa, uh, Lusa, um, 
Rotary Club of Lusaka Maluba. It was one of the six clubs in Lusaka. It had a few women and it was the best decision I made in my life. But that refusal at the beginning made me determine that as a Rotarian, I would bring in as many women into Rotary as I could. In fact, in the early days, I had decided each year I would bring in at least one woman, and I did. So that was the beginning of Rotary. That was in 1995, uh, and it's been Rotary since then, 26 years and going. I have not missed. I have worked in seven different countries. I have been a Rotarian in each one of them. What I did when I got to a country, I first found out whether there was a Rotary Club. If there was a Rotary Club, then automatically they had a member because I was <laughs> already a Rotarian. I wasn't asking to be inducted. I was a Rotarian. So I will just transfer from club to club. But that is what it has been, yes. That's so incredible for me to hear the kind of full circle, you know, journey of it from coming from almost, you know, being rejected in, in a club for being women and now being the second district governor in a row who is female. It's so beautiful. And I know, especially with everything I've been exposed to with Rotary, it's all come from women, you know. It's Anna Marie, it's my mom, it's Charlotte, it's all these amazing, strong, powerful women. So it's very inspiring for someone to like me to see that this has been, you know, an upward fight. And I think even now going on with Empower the Girl Child, I think it's going to mean even that much more knowing the history and where we yes. come from. So that's really beautiful to hear. And inter interesting to note that uh, Rotary, I mean, the, you know that the Rotary Club of Johannesburg was the first Rotary Club in, on the African continent. So it celebrated its 100th birthday this year. You know yes. the centenary. Yes. yes. And in that 100 years, in those 100 years, I am the first black female to be a district governor in a hundred years. I think, I mean, I didn't plan for this. I did, I mean, when I was, when, when you know, when we went for the selection for, for DG, oh, well, I had been uh, not coerced, but had been uh, encouraged <laughs> to apply. And for yeah. several years in a row, I had refused. I was still busy in the UN. Not, then I retired in 2013 and there wasn't a valid reason anymore to say no so i became a club i mean i joined rotary in 1995 i didn't become a club president till 2014. i mean i had i said wow. while i was full-term service i said i had no time for positions i made a, a plea to myself that i would bring in female members i wouldn't have a post but i would be de facto a membership guru which i was <laughs> and uh, but where after i retired okay I mean, everybody's being a, a president. I mean, what do you say? I mean, how can you say you, you can't? Because everybody's giving off their time. And I said to myself, if people who are working have been presidents, then surely after retirement, I have no excuse. Yeah. And so I was president two times in my club. I was AG. And then the, 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 the opportunity to apply for DG came. And I, I did apply. And when I got selected, that's when it hit me. I mean, when the dates... It came to came to be and then I said, Oh dear, for the one hundredth anniversary of Rotary in South Africa as a country, this is the first black female DG. It took them ninety-nine years to get there. But finally <laughs> we're here. <laughs> And it's so special. Well, that's Congratulations it. once again. It's so extremely <laughs> special. And you've mentioned that, you know, you spent some time with the UN and I'm sure throughout your career, you've encountered many other humanitarian organizations, but what would you say makes Rotary special? Oh, several things. Uh, Rotary has a name. I mean, Rotary is Rotary. I mean, there are not two. You know, you can have alliance after that. You can have round table after that. There was Soroptimist even, you know, when Rotary wasn't taking women, organizations sprung up. Soroptimist is an organization. It's a charitable organization, a humanitarian, just like Rotary, but for women. Okay. And I said, oh dear, no, I wouldn't. I mean, now that Rotary is, you know, taking every, uh, everybody, I mean, it's the two sexes in Rotary, I would rather join and well, to cut a long story short, I didn't have friends in the other organizations. I tell you, you join an organization, not one for the organization itself, but two for the people who are there. 
<laughs> because you go into a club or an organization to be in fellowship with those you like. That, I mean, that's the bottom line. Yeah. Let nobody lie you that they joined Rotary because of the ideals of Rotary alone. They were invited by someone. And because Rotary is an organization where you join by being invited, you don't apply to be a Rotarian, no. There are no application forms out there. So somebody sees your worth and sees that you would make a good Rotarian, so to speak. Service above self is, is the motto for Rotary. If somebody sees what you're doing probably in your church, or I have been in my, in my alumni association for schools all my life. From secondary school, we have an alumni association. Not only the alumni association, we have a class association. Wow. So we left secondary school in 1969. You were not born. We have a class reunion. We have a class reunion. Yeah. So that, and then by university, I mean, the, so if I, 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 I am a people's person, I like, I like reunions. I, I like such groups. So I said, if I could be in my alumni associations, and there, usually it's social. Okay, somebody's birthday, we celebrated. Somebody has died, we condole with them. But we really, we didn't do much for the community. Now I joined Rotary in Zambia. It's not my country. Yeah. I mean, the society is not mine, but we were serving the community. So wherever you are, you are serving. That is what, that, that's what got me. Because in whatever country, I mean, I joined Rotary in 95. I joined the UN in 96, incidentally. And from my 17 years in the UN, I worked in six, seven countries. The one stable factor that was in each of these countries was that there was a Rotary Club I was a member of. I didn't need to know anyone in the place. When I got there, I asked, is there a Rotary Club here? Yes, there's a Rotary Club. You found a family automatically because you go there, oh, it's Rotarian, this Rotarian, that, oh, I mean, you felt welcome. So for me, it was my anchor in any of the places I went to. That Rotary was that anchor that brought me suddenly to meet people and to have lifelong friends. I mean, it's, it's, it's been unbelievable. So uh, that's how it has been, yeah. Yeah, and I hear you mentioning and speaking a lot about friends and fellowship and even growing up kind of in Rotary. That's one thing I've always been able to see. No one throws an afternoon tea like Rotarians. And I think yes. it's sad, obviously, we've just, you know, we're still going through the COVID-19 pandemic. And how do you think that affected fellowship and what did Rotarians have to do to adapt to that not being able to kind of you know fellowship in person every week do you think it's changed things and do you think now with um us hopefully coming out of it with the vaccine rollout improving you know continuously do you think we'll be able to get back to the fellowship that we know and love <laughs> yes I think uh COVID has really been a game changer, I must say. On the one hand, it's been sad because we've lost people to COVID, but on the other hand, it has made ro Rotary change. It has made Rotarians even change. There are Rotarians who were, who, who were like the BBC, you know, your, your radio <laughs> and TV. They were born before computers. That's the BBC, I mean. I mean, they, except they had to, they didn't need to use one. But now with the lockdowns and people not being able to meet, we have been able to conduct Rotary virtually. And we are finding out somehow that you, at your meetings, you, you tend to have more people present than when it was physical because they could be in bed on their pillows and be attending a meeting. They didn't need to physically drive to the yeah. place. So on the, in some ways, it's been a convenience. In other ways, it's put a damper on Rotary. Rotary is a touchy-feely organization. We hug, we meet, we, we have drinks together. And that's why there's fellowship. You know, you come in before the meeting starts, you chat, you have a drink. Many clubs are clubs that eat during their meetings. Either it's a lunch, it's a breakfast club, it's a lunch club, or it's a dinner club. So they have a meal. All of that you've lost. 
And don't forget that there are some people who are alone, which means they're single, so to speak, which means they looked forward to Rotary to go and meet friends and have friendship. Now, COVID has made them lock themselves indoors and that opportunity they had to meet other Rotarians has been taken. It's true we can see each other online, but it's not the same thing. I can't touch you. I can't hug you. So it's, 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 it's been a mixed bag, I must say, uh, for several reasons. I mean, the, the fellowship one is one of them because we've not been able to meet. Secondly, it's very difficult to raise funds behind the computer. It's true, you can do GoFundMe and all, but Rotarians are outdoors people. You know, they go do things. It's a golf day here. It's a yeah. race here. We used to go to the great train race in Middleburg. All of that stopped for two years. So the many clubs which depend on fund, fundraising for, 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 for the money, for the funds they needed to do good, have not been able to do this. And uh, then clubs that don't have overseas partners or who don't, who, whose members cannot give as much as others are struggling because they found out that they really don't have any monies in their coffers. Actually, my club is one of those, yes. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not been easy on, on Rotary. But like I say, it, on the other hand, it has, it has made us think outside the box. Because in January 2020, I don't think if you ask Rotarians, if, if this happened, what would you do? I mean, everybody would just it would shut down. But no, we didn't. Quick found a way around things. We started meeting virtually. In fact, many clubs stopped meeting just to get, get their heads around <laughs> how to. And then they started. It, some, some never went back to weekly. Some we went every other week. And then Rotary International itself, the mother body, you know, came to the table to say, you know, to change some things. Rotary, since I have been a Rotarian, was quite a rigid organization. I mean, this this is how things have been done since 1905, therefore. But now they've had to change several things because of the conditions, the prevailing conditions. So on the one hand, COVID has been you know, a, a, a dampener. On the other hand, it has made us develop, be innovative, and that's one good thing. And the more young people like yourself join, the, and you are, you, are, you are virtual people, you are innovative people. I think you are dragging us kicking and screaming into the, into the fourth industrial revolution, whether we want it or not. So <laughs> we're getting there. We're getting there. So that's it. Definitely. I think in all situations, you have to look on the bright side. You know, not yeah. everything will be peachy all the time, but there's always yeah, yeah. a silver lining. And I think that's one thing I've also just noticed about our interactions. You have such a radiance and a positivity that comes out of you. It's so beautiful to be around, even virtually. And Ooh. Um, <laughs> Ooh, thank you. <laughs> I remember at the induction, you had mentioned how one of your major things for Rotary this year is fun. And you just want to make it fun. You want everyone to have a good time. And without giving away too much, because we, we, we need some surprises here and there. But could you just explain a little bit about, you know, how you plan to do that and what that means? Oh, dear. You know, because Rotary, each club, it's its own person. You know, clubs have club antiques, club uh, dynamics, club, uh, you know, the features. Each club it's, it's own, has its own life. So uh, clubs usually do what they've always done. And depending on how the club started, you can find a very joyful club. Like I have, I've started my DG visits of clubs. And I have been overwhelmed by those clubs that start their meeting with the joke of the day. <laughs> That's how to start a meeting. Yeah. I mean, you, there's, you don't know how much it does to the members. When you start on a happy note, the rest of the meeting is happy. If you start on a dour, sour note, I mean, the, the, the human beings are like that. So in, especially in other districts, I have been, I'm, the districts I've enjoyed working in most have been the districts in West Africa. Well, if you see, we are different people. West Africans have this exuberance about them. 
in speech, in dress, in whatever. <laughs> and therefore, at the beginning of a meeting, they said the grace, somebody said a joke, it could be a lewd joke, it could be whatever, but it got everybody cracked. That loosened the atmosphere. Then we sang a rotary, I, I have a book, of rotary songs from I different didn't districts. Know rotary has yes, song. there is a book, Rotary Songs. And it's many were not composed for rotary. You know, you take a regular hymn. Yeah. And 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 put some rotary words. Yes. And so they sing a rotary song to start the meeting. I need to get you my feel all, <laughs> You feel all rotary after that. And so whatever happens, you know, and they end the meeting in like manner. They tell some jokes, they, the, the sergeant at arms does sergeant duties and in, in, introduces all manner of joke in it. They would find you, like now, if I were the sergeant, I would look at her and said, Max, I'm finding you for the lipstick. It's too red or it's not red enough. <laughs> Max, I'm finding you for the hair. How come it is brunette? Why isn't it blonde? I mean, they raised money in the wildest sort of ways, fun ways. It was just a joy to be in a Rotary meeting. But here somehow, I think, I think it's the baggage of the past, how Rotary started. All male, all white male, possibly, and possibly elderly male, they were not into laughing, into joking, into, I mean, it was a strict, it, it, for me, that's how it looked. It was a very, heavy, well, the clubs I knew, probably that's not all of them, are, that, that's not how all of them are. But I am getting pleasantly surprised now because I'm visiting clubs and I'm seeing that, yes, they, thank God there's hope. There are some clubs out there where you feel, you know, I, I've told some members, I wish, I don't want to offend my club. I would, I would ditch them any day and join your club. It's just such a pleasure to be with you, yes. That's what Rotary is supposed to be. Because the four men who started Rotary, he did not start Rotary with a project in mind. No. There were four people who were new in Chicago, coming from different places, and wanted friends. And they decided to meet each week so they could share ideas. They had coffee or tea or a meal together. It was first a friendship and a fellowship. But then when they found out that they were the well-off in the society, how could they help those who were not as well off? That's how projects came about. But the initiation of Rotary was not, the four people didn't come and say, oh, there's poverty here, or they say, well, let's fix it. No, that's not how they started. They started as a fellowship of friends. And I would love for that to come back to Rotary. You know, when they say, oh, we can't get members, or oh, the young people aren't joining us. I, well, I said, why would the young people join us? There's nothing to look forward to. <laughs> I mean, they don't want to come to a meeting where you know, it's these old folks telling them what to do. And I mean, that, no. So, so I think you, the young, if you're in clubs, you need to invite. When young people see other young people in clubs, they want to join them. And then it's the young people who should, who should make it attractive for them to join them, yes. Definitely. So before <laughs> I let you go and keeping in the spirit of fun, I think we should play a little game. When we had, you know, the discussion in the committee about what should I ask Stella? I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to ask him. It's like, we just want to know about her. So we're going to play a little game of favorites. I'm going to ask you what your favorite things are in specific categories, and you have to explain, give a little background story. Is that okay with you? Sure. Okay. That's so if, well, I, I hope I have fav I mean, favorite things. Sometimes <laughs> yeah, so we we'll have been so much in one, one, in one area. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll do it. I'll play. I'll okay. play. <laughs> Starting easy, what is your favorite food? Food? Yes. Oh, dear. Now, you know, let me, let me tell you a secret. We live, we've been in South Africa uh, 14 years. I have eaten, I am from Cameroon originally, mm -hmm. West Central Africa. I have eaten Cameroonian food almost every day of the 14 years. I go look for it. I mean, I might not find it in ShopRite or in uh, uh, a spa or in Pick and Pay. I will go to an ethnic food store and look for it. 
So when I tell you what I love to eat, you might not even know it. I love plantains. I love you know what plantains too. are? Most okay, good. Love them. Plantains are our staple food where we come from. Okay. So we have them in all kinds of ways. It's boiled plantains, it's fried plantains, it's roasted plantains. It's plantains in any which, any which way. It's on its own. It's with a sauce. It's with beef or fish. I mean, that's, that's it. I love cassava as well. Me and too. you know cassava because there's cassava <laughs> in, in Zambia. That, I mean, the, the north of Zambia. I mean, so even when I lived in Zambia, we lived in Zambia for almost over 10 years. We ate Cameroonian every day. I mean, we, ate, we just went to look for the ethnic foods we knew and ate those. Because that's how, that's how we've been. I lived in the U.S. five years. I ate Cameroonian every single day. <laughs> if you ask me what it is a hamburger is like, I might not know because I don't know when I ate what one last. I mean, that's how it is. So I love my ethnic foods. My kids who grew up all abroad love our ethnic foods because that's how we brought them up. Yes, so I just love native traditional food and most, most of it is plant-based so it's the it's the it's the plants it's either tubers like yam or like uh, cassava it's always vegetables of all sorts the spinaches your 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 rape i mean all of it yeah guess what i ate today impua oh from can Zambia. i tell you one story <laughs> That's right. So I love Zambian food more than anything. You'll ask uh -huh. mom, I will drive from Pretoria, I'll drive home and be like, I just want in shima and beans and carpet and everything. But so there was sushima and impua. <laughs> the one With thing other I things. cannot stand is impua. It's oh, really? the only thing I don't like. I don't know, maybe it's an acquired taste. Maybe I need to... It is an acquired taste, yes. <laughs> But that's great. Okay, next one is what is your favorite book that you've ever read? Oh dear, that's a tough one because I mean you've read so many of them. How could I say which one was favorite? I can't even remember what it is I've read. Okay, maybe the, your but, favorite uh, you've read this but year. Let let me tell you, I mean, I will, you know, when we talk of book, and this year my secondary school is 60 years old. And we are, cele we are celebrating its uh, 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 Diamond Jubilee. And I, I remember this now because you are asking me the question. Each class has been asked to write what they remember of the class. And I would, that's why the book comes in. Okay. Because uh, the book, uh, my classmates have a name. We, we, each class chooses a name for itself. And we, were, we are called the majors. And it was because of the name of a person in a book. The book is Animal Farm. Oh, wow. <laughs> Where we, the story about some animals are more equal than others. Uh -oh. It was the old major that said that. Yeah. So can you imagine from 1967, that book is still in our heads. We still quote the book. That's amazing. So apart from everything else I have read in secondary, in university, medical school, postgrad, PhD, Animal Farm stands in my mind. That's crazy. And it's amazing how Animal Farm specifically has traveled because I did Animal Farm in school. Yes. I did Animal yes. Farm in school. It's amazing. Yes. And yes. the last question I have for you before I let you go, I mean, you've mentioned having lived in so many countries and I'm sure you've visited so many countries, but what is your favorite place to go on holiday to? Not necessarily to live, but your favorite holiday destination. Ah, holiday destination. Okay. Uh, the, the, uh, the favorite, favorite, I'm not too sure, but there the, have been good places we've been to. And um, the one, okay, I, uh, one, I lived in it, unfortunately. So for the three years I was there, it was like a holiday every day. <laughs> I, my first international post from the UNWHO was at the, in the Seychelles. I oh, was wow. the World Health organization wow. representative in the Seychelles. It was like being on a vacation every single day because from any corner of either my office or my home, there was the ocean. The Indian Ocean was there. I mean, I, I walked to the beach. I mean, it was, it was just people pay thousands of dollars to go on holidays to the Seychelles. I lived there. 
So it was a holiday for three years. So, so, but let me put that apart. A place where, and I, I'll tell you about Seychelles before I put it apart, to just tell you how Seychelles, uh, um, you know, marked me. When I went to Seychelles, I met one Rotary Club. There was only one Rotary Club. It, Seychelles is made up of 115 islands. It's an archipelago in the Indian Ocean, but there are only three islands which are inhabited. So the capital is on one island and then two other smaller islands. In that capital, uh, Mahé, there was only one Rotary Club. And so when I got there, I said, well, you know, unfortunately I can't choose any other Rotary Club because there's none. So this is my Rotary Club. I was the second female in the club. Wow. I was the only black woman in the club. I was probably the third or fourth black person with three or Seychelles, if you know, it is a, it's a country like this, but it's mostly Indian, Creole, what you call colored here, and Blacks, so all together. So I said to myself, every year I'm here, I will bring in one female into the club, which I did for three years. I brought in three females. And the first Seychellois, native Seychelles woman, Black woman, who joined the club, I told her, I said, the day you become the president of this club, because the club was, the club even had produced a PDA DG for the Indian Ocean. I said, the day you become a president in this club, it doesn't matter where in the world I am, I will come to your induction. Well, four years down the line, I was in Zambia, back to Zambia as WHO rep, and my friend Marie Pierre was being inducted wow. as the president of the club. My two kids were in the UK. We flew them in from the UK. The four of us went to Seychelles for that induction. That's so beautiful. Because it was just so important to me that we had moved this far mm. in, in Rotary in those islands. But my, uh, let me go now to the country where for a vacation, I think I've enjoyed it the most. Yes. It would be the Cayman Islands. After having lived in Seychelles, I think being surrounded by water was just a good thing. Yeah. And we have been to the Cayman Islands twice. It's a far, it's a long trip. I mean, it's far off, way there in the, in the, in the Pacific uh, in a, a Ocean, but it is a lovely place to go to. So it, uh, each time we go there, it just reminded us of the three years we spent in Seychelles. And so that's, that's that, yeah. For me, that's Perfect. Nice. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for taking time to speak to us. Hopefully this goes out soon and everyone gets to hear everything you've filled my mind with. You've made my day. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, I just want to wish you well in your rotary journey. I think uh, it's a wonderful thing. I, I need to take your contact. So my, none of my kids is a Rotarian. I think they just saw how busy it was and they said, no, we don't have time for this. Yeah. So I told Jacqueline's daughter, I mean, I told Caroline's daughter, Jacqueline, who is in the UK, my kids, my son is still in the UK, he's been there 20 whatever years, is that they're British now. I said, you know, I will send you my son's details. Please, you might convince him to become a Rotarian because I think it's a good thing for young people yeah. if they find other young people that they can interact with. So I want to wish you well in your rotary journey i think you'll do well and just keep keep on there yeah thank do you well. so much do thank well. you enjoy the rest of your evening. all right thanks thank you so much thanks bye. for the interview much appreciated okay bye-bye <laughs>